out of an abundance of caution. (laughs) That's the best. That's the best. I've not heard that one before and I've heard them all. Please tell me there's a we take security seriously. By an abundance of caution. We are providing notice to individuals whose information may have been impacted. May have been impacted. Sent to all. (laughs) Make sure it's BCC. Smashing Security, Episode 328, UPS Mishing, Chat GPT 101, and Storing Secret Files, with Carol Terrio and Graham Cluley. Hello, hello, and welcome to Smashing Security, Episode 328. My name's Graham Cluley. God, that's a big number, and I'm Carol Terrio. Hello, Carol. <laughs> Hi, welcome Graham. back from your holidays. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And what a delight it must have been to come back to find that Smashing Security... The one and only... ...is an award winner. Again. (sighs) That's right, isn't it, Tom? (laughs) Hi, Tom Langford. (laughs) Hi, Tom Langford from the Host Unknown podcast. Of the What's-Its-Name podcast. Humiliating (laughs) it was. I had to go and pick up two awards and they were both for you. Do you know um, they got in touch with me saying, please come, please come. And I was like, I wish I could, but I'm on holiday. I can't go, but I'm sure Tom Langford will pick them up for us. <laughs> and Graham, I know, can't be asked. <laughs> yeah. So Yvonne Eskenzi said, can you be around to pick up just in case? And then I double thought it and thought, oh, perhaps that's a double bluff. Uh-huh. <laughs> and she wants to make sure that I'm there so I can pick up. Yes. I, was, I had three things in the mix. I, I, you know, statistically, I was. Oh, <laughs> dear. No, but no. Couldn't believe it. Thank you once again to all of our listeners who voted us and yes. uh, allowed us to win. What was it? Most entertaining cybersecurity podcast and best all rounder cybersecurity podcast or something like that. Um, so Did you have to put your waist measurements in, Graham? <laughs> well, the best all rounder. Uh, the. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for showing up to the awards because, of course, Carol and I couldn't be asked. Um, so no, we, and we, thank we, you, Eskenzi <laughs> PR, for yes. facilitating the party. It was very well done. Uh, I'm going to kick the show off, so uh, buckle up. But before we kick off, let's thank this week's wonderful sponsors, Bitwarden, Collide, and Drata. It's their support that help us give you this show for free. Now, coming up in today's show, Graham, what do you got? Well, it's not so much smashing security this week as smishing security. I do not think you should screw up with her name like that. Okay, and Tom, what about you? Oh, I am talking about the difference that a few million dollars in personal net worth makes in how the law treats you. Okay, and I'm dumbing down ChatGPT, or am I? We'll find out. All this and much more coming up on this episode of Smashing Security. Now, chums, chums, uh, you know, we we talk a lot about bad news. We talk a lot about companies goofing up. And I think we actually need to praise companies sometimes when they raise awareness as to the threats which are out there and give a little bit. So I thought I'd do something a little bit different. What, Cheery? Sorry. What show is this? You're going to do an interesting story. I thought. (laughs) Cheeky. Wow. I thought. Yeah. He picks up an award and he's all spiky, spiky. <laughs> Come on, you to earn your award. Anyway, listen, I thought let's actually applaud a company doing something right because UPS in Canada, the delivery firm, has gone out of its way to contact customers. Uh, they sent them a letter. Um, and I thought it's worth reading out because there's some great advice in here, which I think would be suitable for everyone who Are listens to the show. Are you being facetious? I'm worried you're being facetious. No, okay. no. <laughs> as if I would, as if that okay. ever showed up I'm, in my school okay. report. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> you mentioned so, Canada as well, and you know it's dear to oh, my heart. Oh, don't worry about that. It just happens it's UPS Canada who are forward-thinking enough to send this out. So you get this letter, and it says at the top, fighting fishing and smishing. An update from UPS. Okay. That's all right, isn't it? Yeah. It's- at UPS, at UPS, we are committed to fighting fraud. We want to let you know what phishing and smishing are and what you can do to protect yourself. Very good. Right. I'm happy. That's good. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I think education is, is what's needed. In many By places. the way, I've never liked the word smishing 
That's Why? meant to be that's phishing via SMS, isn't it? Yes, right. I, it's always conjured up things of you know a bare foot squishing over a, a tomato or something. Yeah. I just think it's making up a word just for you know some PR person once thought, oh, how can we make this interesting? I think it's cute. I like it much more than B E C. <laughs> so there B-E-C you go. B E C is rubbish, isn't it? It's rubbish. But, uh, spear fishing. Hey, oh, but it. spear fish. Okay, we're we're going on a, we're going off on a tangent. <laughs> See, spear phishing, I always thought was a phishing email sent to someone specifically, and now it seems people are saying spear phishing when yeah. there's when there's an attachment. Whereas I, oh, I always view phishing no, as something. No, 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 it's aimed. It's aimed. Well, like well, they've you, done a bit the of language may have evolved since you joined the cyber yeah. community, though. Maybe it has. I always think of <laughs> phishing as someone clicking on a link. I don't think of I it agree. as having an attachment. So I don't know. It just feels all a little bit sort of. Anyway, back to Lucy Goosey. Back to UPS's letter. What are phishing and smishing, they say in bold? Fraudulent emails referred to as phishing and text messages referred to as smishing are becoming more common. That's true. Fraudsters attempt to convince package recipients that they owe money for delivery of a package and send text messages or emails to solicit credit card and other payment card data. And we've all seen that, haven't we? We've all received something like this. I often fall for it because I never know what I order, right? What do you mean you fall for it? So you, no, <laughs> what, but you click on the link. I, no, no, I don't. Drunk Amazon, right? <laughs> no, I never do that. But uh, yeah, I, I order stuff. And then sometimes you, know, you expect it in one package, but it dribbles in in lots of packages. Right. right. That's normally if they've thrown the box. No, but it's like if it's coming from a different, different depot, something, something. Anyway, uh, whatever. So I never know if it's going to be three or four or five. And then if I get a text and I know something's coming, I'm like, did I get everything? Am I waiting for something? Uh, is this one? And I just so my husband, he goes, no, fuck off. It's stupid. You never ask yourself how they got hold of your mobile phone number to send you an SMS? Well, I... No. Because they have your address, but they yes. don't have your mobile phone number normally, do they? That's I don't the, know. That's the sneaky thing. Is that thing. the sneaky thing? Okay, that's a really good tip. I think that's a good tip. Okay, let's go back to the UPS's letter because you know, right? this is sharing great information. These messages may appear legitimate by incorporating company brands, colours or other legal disclaimers. Yeah. These fraud attempts affect deliveries from many carriers, brackets in other words, not just UPS. Yeah. You can learn more about common types of fraud and see examples of fraudulent messages at incredibly long URL, right? Okay. The letter goes on. Have you been smished? If you've received something that doesn't look or feel right, trust your instincts. Real UPS texts, at least in Canada, will only come from SMS number 69877. In Canada, yeah. In Canada. Hang on, hang on, hang, hang, hang on yeah. a minute. Now, I'm just a CISO, so not exactly <laughs> technically minded no. here. But I have it on pretty good authority that numbers can be spoofed. That is true, isn't it? Yeah, they can be. So you could send an SMS message probably pretending to come from the real UPS Canada number. From 69877, yeah. yeah I guess right. you could. Uh, good point. Good point, Tom. Yeah, well... So far, though, most of this has been quite sensible, I think. It's been quite good advice. And, and informative and easy, easy to, to read, read, yeah. At least if you didn't have two idiots interrupting me. <laughs> I've said nothing for, like, minutes, but anyway. UPS is aware <laughs> that some package recipients have received fraudulent text messages demanding payment before a package can be delivered. UPS has been working with partners in the delivery chain to try to understand how that fraud was being perpetrated. As part of that effort, UPS conducted an internal review to assess whether information it received from shippers was contributing to this fraudulent conduct. In other words, is some information leaking out? And and, and it's not us. It's some third party that we partner with. Mm, It's not us. Well, the next sentence, Krill. During that review, UPS discovered a method by which a person who searched for a particular package or misused a package lookup tool could obtain more information about the delivery, including a recipient's phone number. In other words, they've snuck in and we're in about paragraph five or six now. We might have had an issue. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. In other words, we messed up our website. Out of an abundance of... Of caution. <laughs> hey. That's the best. That's the best. Oh, I've not heard that one before, and I've heard them all. 
Please tell me there's a We Take Security series at some point. By an abundance of caution. We are providing notice to individuals whose information may have been impacted. May have been impacted. Uh, sent to all. <laughs> Make so, sure it's BCC. <laughs> I would. So if I'd got this letter, <laughs> yeah. I would have started reading just thinking, oh, blah, blah. They're just telling me what fishing and smishing are. Yeah, you wouldn't have got past you the first would- paragraph. This is not a breach notification notice, is it? Hidden inside the longest paragraph of all is this yeah. little bit saying, yeah, we fucked up. you may have been impacted by this. So they're saying their package lookup tool has been leaking recipients' names, shipment addresses, <laughs> potentially phone numbers, order numbers. It says, we can't tell you exactly when this has been happening, but it looks like it has been happening to some customers from February 2022 until the end of April 2023. Uh, Blimey. So those texts, if you'd received one, it may have been a lot more convincing because, and this is thanks to the folks at Bleeping Computer, they've uncovered people who were expecting deliveries from UPS who got very, very convincing messages. Right. Now, Tom, you are a big fan of Apple tech and you're also a huge fan of Lego, aren't you? Yep. Well, we're going to link in the show notes mm-hmm. to a couple of examples from people who were expecting deliveries via UPS of a Lego order. And they got text messages saying, your Lego order is waiting delivery to your shipping address, the postal code, blah, blah, blah. You need to pay a shipping fee uh, in order to have the parcel on time to avoid delays. Click here. As if criminals <laughs> couldn't sink any lower. <laughs> They mess with a man's Lego. <laughs> Good God. I, I just, I, I feel like I, I feel dirty. You now. would have fallen for this, I suspect, Tom, because the one thing you want is you want your Lego arriving promptly. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I have no idea what I ordered half the time. Yeah, but don't you think, okay, there's a few, there's a few typos in this, one. And two, there's like this weird dollar sign at the back end of the money like the money thing looks really odd yeah one five five dollars in this example yes you see you're looking at mm. a screenshot in this example it's 1.55 dollar but no one would write that one. yeah no that's yeah. the oh yeah yeah and there's another one for 1.63 dollar so that would be a dead giveaway but would it would yes it though Carol, would that stop you who's believing? falling for this who's falling for this yeah well it would have stopped many of us, but the point is that in many cases, and we, we know this from all the scammers, etc., that they sometimes seed in these deliberate mistakes to weed out the people who are going to work it out at some point. What they want to get are the people who the more gullible maybe ones. Maybe don't yeah, who maybe don't quite have the same sort of you know, cognitive abilities to, to see things It's not things just out. cognitive. It's digital ability, right? This could be your first purchase online. Yeah. yeah. You know? Well, exactly. Yes. Yes, it's very true. Because very presumably true. The, the, the scammers aren't going to all this effort to just steal $1.63. When you go to the URL, it's going to grab other personal information or, or charge your card more than that. Exactly. And also, they've sent out probably a couple of million of these. <laughs> because there's that much Lego going by UPS. <laughs> so, well, there is the chip in them. <laughs> and just saying. Well, if anybody has a spare room I can use, that'd be great. So, it's not just Lego, apparently it's Apple as well and other firms apparently. Oh, so, what? so there are all ma- <laughs> I don't know what other I feel personally targeted. <laughs> so, there are all manner of potentially, you know, people who are falling for much more convincing delivery failure or you you need to act upon this UPS message uh, smishing camp I hate the word smishing uh, campaigns are never before what's the advice the advice mm. don't call us we'll call you ne- <laughs> never trust anyone ever no so so I get a UPS I'm waiting for one do I, well, you know, I my, my first piece of advice is complain to UPS because they have disguised this piece of advice they've hidden it as much as possible behind what looks like a generic piece of yeah, Watch that's... out for fishers and smishers. Yeah. Does that get a shame, shame from you? It, it is. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> the piece of advice I'd say is, if in doubt, wait two days, your package is going to arrive anyway, and then you know it's a scam. Yeah, you don't have to get your knickers in a twist right away. Yeah, no need to rush. Tom, are you, re- are you really that patient when it comes to a 
hot piece of Lego? Well, I mean... <sighs> You're on mute now. Am I? No, I'm not. What are you talking about? Don't get me worried. Then. <laughs> I just didn't want him to talk about a hot piece of Lego in a dirty way. Oh, I see. Tom, Tom, what have you got for us this week? So, what have I got for you? I've got uh, a little story, which is it's a story almost as old as time, actually, about whistleblowers. In fact, I found a Wikipedia page that lists all of the famous whistleblowers going all the way back to the 1600s, which uh, is 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 a rabbit hole you don't want to go down. Did, did it involve a rabbit? Is it uh, the Garden of Eden? Of course, there was a whistleblower there, wasn't there? Someone, what? Yes. Someone told the boss guy That's that right. the, the apple's been pinched. Um, and so, yep. uh, yeah, so it has been, has been going back at least, oh, 3,000 years. It's, uh, <laughs> I don't think Wikipedia's got any quotes or sources for that okay. one, but uh, there is a story. The link is in the show notes. It's from the Office of Public Affairs of the U.S. Department of Justice, and it talks about a former FBI analyst who was sentenced for retaining classified documents. So there's this FBI analyst, her name is Kendra Kingsbury, 50, of Garden City, Kansas, and she was sentenced to 46 months federal prison, followed by three years of supervised Ouch. release. Mm. And the reason for that is uh, she pled guilty to two counts of unlawfully retaining documents related to national defence. Bottom line was she was in an analyst for the FBI for 12 years and she was caught taking a whole bunch of confidential documents away and taking them home, basically. Now, she held a top-secret security clearance so she could see confidential, right. secret, and top-secret documents. All of the documents she took were classified as secret, so the middle level, but many of which include documents that describe intelligence sources and methods related to US governments, uh, all to do with countering terrorism, counterintelligence. It also included numerous documents classified as secret from other government agencies oh boy. Uh, describing intelligence sources related to US government efforts to collect uh, intelligence on terrorism. Do groups. we know why she was taking these home? Or was it just for a little bit of light reading well, or something? What was the point of that? Well, the investigation. And, and this isn't even the crux of it. The investigation actually turned out more questions than answers because when they uh, analysed and reviewed uh, her telephone records, revealed a number of suspicious calls, including numbers associated with subjects of counterterrorism investigations. What? And those individuals also made calls back to Kingsbury. So there's obviously something <laughs> going on here, right? You know, so not only did she take these documents where she wasn't supposed to, all classified at secret level, not top secret level. Um, but uh, there was subsequently found to be some kind of you know, sharing of said documents and uh, you know, other activity. Uh, that took me down another rabbit <laughs> hole because, as I said, she was sentenced to, what was it, 46 months. That took me down the rabbit hole of a woman called Reality Winner which oh, is yes. not the name of a of a TV show on Channel 5, but she was uh, an analyst in the NSA. She was a translator there. She released one document to the press, which was basically information about Russian interference in the 2016 election. Yep. She was arrested. Obviously, I mean, you, you know, you found this stuff has been released, etc. Good, although you could say it's for the greater good. She was charged with removing classified material from a government facility and mailing it to a news uh, outlet. She was denied bail and then sentenced to 63 months in prison, which if you do the sums, hmm. five and a half years in prison. So for, for releasing one document compared to... This other person, Kingsbury, who you know, stole a whole bunch of documents, made some dodgy phone calls, 
you know, uh, sentenced to four Do you years. remember, Tom, how Reality Winner was caught and identified? I don't off the top oh. of my head. And there's an awful lot of text in this Wikipedia story, so I'm not going to Well, let, let me tell you, because it's quite interesting. In fact, we spoke about it in a past episode of Smashing Security uh, okay, recall, a few recall. years ago. Uh, but um, what happened was she printed out some of this sensitive information at her workplace. Yes. And she gave those printouts to reporters at The Intercept, which was the uh, news outlet who That's reported right, yeah. it. And The Intercept, unfortunately, just scanned it in or took a photograph or something and, and, and published it up on their site rather than retyping the information. And printers... Uh, have unique signatures. Well, they leave this uh, little matrix of nearly invisible yellow dots on your documents. So you can identify which printer printed out a particular document. This is useful information, by the way, if you're planning to write a ransom note or something like that. You can <laughs> your print now. You know why people cut up newspapers. <laughs> yeah. So, so it was this these yellow dots which actually led to the arrest ultimately of Reality Winner. But uh, it's it's very interesting. I think not many people realise that printers do that. Yeah, I think it's I, I, absolutely fascinating. And, and so here's two cases, just yeah. two cases where we're seeing secret documents, even a top secret document, potentially being leaked by or women. Or yeah. By women. Well, yes. Yeah, the only two stories women. you picked. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. I think that I think there is a case of a man who may have taken documents, really, uh, of a I, highly sensitive information have I heard nature, of and, and maybe taken them to his home in Florida. Did he? Um, I, so, and here's the thing: this is the difference. This is the difference me. a few million dollars yeah. in personal net worth makes. So bottom line is we've got Donald the Trump who has taken boxes of material, uh, said he's returned all of it. <laughs> he absolutely hadn't, despite very clearly stating that he had. When his mar a -Lago residence was raided, there was stuff found everywhere. In public places, you know, a ballroom and a, and a bathroom and all that sort of stuff, top secret documents, allegedly relating to you know, nuclear secrets and stuff like that. And not only was Donald Trump not requested to post bail, um, he's certainly not been arrested and is is basically throwing money at the problem to try and make it go away. Oh, you're you're so cynical. I I think Donald Trump was playing three dimensional chess here. I think he's much cleverer than everyone thought because of he knew Donald Trump couldn't fling poo at a wall and make it stick. <laughs> he knew, he knew that this highly sensitive information definitely wasn't safe on government premises, and so he thought, I know what I'll do. I'll <laughs> store it in the highly secure loos. At Mara Lago. Yes. Mm -hmm. Stacks and ballrooms. In the ballroom. So, because that's the last place that people will look. Because people won't expect me to have... It, see, that's the genius. People won't expect the highly sensitive information to have been left <laughs> accessible to anyone. It's only been caught talking, boasted about it. You know, talking to people about the types of data he's got in his, no doubt, not exactly the most secure compound in the world. <laughs> I mean, and I just, I just find this utterly amazing. How this is, this is quite a tangent. <laughs> a, a tangent. This is the point. A tangerine. It, I basically, think. if you're, you're a tangerine, if you're famous and you've got money, it's, it's effectively one rule for us and one rule for them. We've got this charade going on. It's not a case of if you can't do the time, do the crime. It's, it's, it's just more a case of. If you can afford to do the crime, then crack on because nobody's yeah, so going to do Yeah, so all you ex-US presidents out there, listen up. A few of them do listen to the podcast, actually, Carol. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. At least two. <laughs> anyway, rant's over. Carol, what's your topic for us this week? So as you both know, and as regular listeners know, I've been on summer holiday. Ta-da, ta-da, ta-da. Mm. Lovely. And, uh, you know, when you're on summer holiday, um, I met a number of people. I talked to lots of people. I met a cool chick on the plane. I met a great chef. I met an Airbnb host who thought that people staying in a non-air-conned pad would rejoice at pure, 100% pure polyester sheets. So, uh, 
That was really fun. You should have seen my Yeti of a husband. I, I wondered if this was just your Airbnb review that you were about to give in your <laughs> section of the podcast. That's right. Um, close. After you electrocuted each other every oh morning. Oh my God. <laughs> We ended up sleeping with towels, all I'm saying. Anyway, loved it, loved it. Um, oh, and we went to this super shishi hotel, okay, like overlooking oh. the rolling hills of Istria, right? Like think super poshy posh, like mismatch mm. fabrics and pop art and terrazzo floors and big, big lights, okay? Like the whole thing. And we just were going there for just like a, you know, a Coke to look at the sunset. <laughs> but I'm going to send you the art that was outside the front. I'm going to send it on our little... uh text message thingy here okay so take a look and maybe one of all's good to have a visual on a podcast yeah mm -hmm. excellent yeah and now you guys get to describe it because uh just zoom oh, in it's, it's and my describe favorite this. password <laughs> it looks like it's um uh, there's little statues or gnomes of is it snow white and the uh six six dwarfs <laughs> yeah, the six dwarfs holy crap um, the face the face is a bit scary. Looks like Mike Tyson has had a go. <laughs> I had no idea until just like before I went on this podcast. I had no idea why that was there because it's super creepy. It's like zombie Snow White and the Seven Dwarves or something. But uh, I think it's because they don't want kids there. I think it's like an adult hotel, that kind of thing. Like it's not a family hotel. So maybe these are just to scare off the kids. If you don't want kids, just block YouTube. Then the kids won't want to go there. That's true. That's what you have to do. <laughs> anyway, so I was meeting all these interesting people uh, and they would say, oh, what do you do? You know, and I'd be like, art, yada, yada, podcast, yada, yada. And some would go and, you know, look at art and some would listen to the pods. And one of them called me up afterwards and said, look, I've just listened to three episodes of Smashing Security in a row. And you guys are amazing. You're great. You're wonderful. But. Oh, you're kidding me. But, she said, but. You're talking about things I'm totally interested in that I want to learn about, but I can't figure out the language you're using. I don't understand it. It's all tech speak. You know, like you talked about chat GPT or whatever, and I Are couldn't you? follow. Right. And this lady is a GP. Oh, you see GP, GPT. Uh, but, you know, she's brainy. She's funny. But our stupid tech only lingo kind of puts up this like anti learning fence. So I am sorry to her and all the other listeners. And I'm going to try and describe it here in a way, but there's a good uh, piece of info for you guys that know this inside out at the end. So stay with us. And you're, you guys are going to help me, okay? If I say something too techy, you just go, uh, let me just describe what it is. I, I was I was going to say that on the other award-winning podcast, Host Unknown, we talk tech a lot, but my mother listens and she says she doesn't understand a word of what's going on. But she has liked the recent trend of having Mr. Cluley on because <laughs> she really likes Graham's voice. Oh. She finds it very, um, very, oh, how can I? Oh, how lovely. War very warming, I think. Oh, the meet in person. Yeah, that would des destroy <laughs> everything, wouldn't it, if we met in person? But yes, I have to start calling you son. Yes, Daddy. <laughs> But it's not always about the content. Sometimes it's about the delivery. Uh, okay, I'll do my best on that one as well. Okay. <laughs> okay, so it's ChatGPT, right? This is the thing that launched in November yes. last year. So it's no wonder that lots of people don't know about it. And like, so what the heck is it? Well, I thought, why not ask ChatGPT, right? Oh, okay. It said uh, ChatGPT is an advanced conversational AI model developed by a company called OpenAI. Well, well AI? AI? Sorry, what's AI? Artificial intelligence. Very good, Tom. Thank you. I didn't spot that one. Oh, I was listening. Very good. Number two, ChatGPT is trained on a diverse range of internet text sources to learn patterns, grammar, and context in order to generate coherent and contextually appropriate responses. Now, apparently the data set has at least 300 billion words in it. So diverse, I think, is a little misleading wow. here. I think, like, you know, gluts and gluts and gluts of stuff that they could find is maybe perhaps more realistic. Would you guys agree? 300 billion words. So yes. it's just nonsense it's scooped up from the internet, isn't it? That's right. That's right. I, and I think just to put that into context, isn't a million seconds is something like 21 days, whereas a billion seconds is something like 30 years. 
Okay, you work out while I can say my story 300 billion words into seconds and then let us know. <laughs> uh, so, so basically, but the thing is, it's a tool right now available to anyone that speaks the supported languages, I guess, right? Anyone with internet access. What you can do is go to openai.com and you will find ChatGPT there, right? It's free to use, but you have to create an account and there's nothing to learn or set up. Basically a search box, like any search engine, and you can put in a question and allons-y, right? You, uh, you see what crops up. So you could ask a question about medicine or real estate or mythical monsters or recipes or help me out, uh, poetry. What does allons-y mean in English? That kind of thing. The, the, yeah. You could exactly. ask, ask it anything. Yes. <laughs> It's true. And apparently ChatGPT uh, currently has more than 100 million users, right? Which is why investors are tripping over themselves to get on the AI, sorry, artificial intelligence model train, choo-choo all the way to the bank. Now, the thing is that there is a catch, right? You cannot trust the information spouted by ChatGPT to be 100% correct any of the time, I would say. Yeah, because it lies. Yeah. But why does it lie? Because the internet is made up of good stuff and bad stuff and gross stuff, Tom. And so so much charming. But sometimes it makes up stuff as well. When Mark Stockley was on a few weeks ago, he was telling us about that law case where chat GPT was coming up with fake (laughs) past verdicts, fake cases and you know, and it was persisting in claiming that these things were real and they weren't. And it, it was just making it up. Oh, fake cases. That's right. Yes. Yes. So the way to think about it, it's just made up from everything it could find on the internet. So in short, ChatGPT's mama is the internet and it gorged, okay, I'm going to say it, at the internet mama nipple until it was ready to be unveiled to the world. I'm sorry. <laughs> what? Like, as Graham said, there's loads of stories about how ChatGPT, you know, got it wrong or spread crazy stuff. And you can go look at our backlog of smashing security episodes because we've talked about it a lot. And the question is, is who decided to allow ChatGPT or any of these artificial intelligent models into the public world? So I thought, I'll ask ChatGPT. And it said it was made by the organization or company responsible for the development and deployment. In this case, OpenAI and ChatGPT, the decision was made by OpenAI itself. And the point I'm making is there's no regulatory oversight here. It's just one company going, okay, we're ready. Are we ready? Let's go. Do you think there should be then? Yes, I think. Do you think that? Do you not think so? Well, I just think, I mean, the. the, You like it all Yahoo-y? The the, the (laughs) counter argument is that you're going to prevent innovation, aren't you? And how would they define what you are allowed to do on the internet and what you're not allowed to do? I mean, imagine how much it would constrict Tom, for starters, with what he gets up to on the internet. Exactly. And also, the internet is an open resource, right? You you know, if it's behind a paywall, you can't get to it. If If it's supposed to be private, it's private, you can't get to it. Everything that you can find on the internet freely is there freely, right? It could have just gone to a library if it had a body and fingers and eyes, it could have gone to libraries and read everything mm-hmm. in a library, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, Maybe what I'm trying to say is instead of using chat GPT, thinking it's an omniscient God that knows everything, maybe we should treat it as a kind of teenager with mood swings and a bit of a know-it-all. I looked at what jobs are at high risk with ChatGPT on the horizon. Podcast is number one. No, podcast. Uh, absolutely not. Podcast is safe. Podcast is safe. <laughs> okay. Who do you think might be really affected? Journalists. Uh, jo- yes. I was going to say writers. Um, yeah. Accountants, tax people, auditors. Tree surgeons. Yes. Okay. Blockchain engineers, apparently. Mathematicians. Okay. We're all talking about roles. Actually, I have no. Um, Sympathy for whatsoever. <laughs> Sex workers. <laughs> Milkmen. They're done as well. Um, the jobs that are Piers deemed... Piers Morgan. Piers Morgan. <laughs> jobs that are deemed most safe include athletes, car repair people, cooks, <laughs> and, and get this, this is my favourite, stonemasons. 
<laughs> Stonemasons, you guys are fine. So high five to you for, you know, having not gotten in the digital bandwagon. Well done. Okay, I'm going to have to become an athlete. <laughs> There's not going to be much call for a stonemason when the robot overlords have uh, basically put us all in little pods to produce batteries <laughs> and produce energy for them, is there? I mean, it's not the most, you know, common of, uh, of requirements. They're not going to be creating gothic arches for these massive cathedrals of, of battery power. <laughs> yeah, but it's kind of crazy because, like, there's, like, this huge race now for market domination. Currently, I think... I think, correct me if I'm wrong, the winner the, in the front is OpenAI at the moment, right? They have the lead. But yesterday, Google's DeepMind CEO, like, mic drop that his new AI algorithm, uh, soon to be on the digital selves, will eclipse chat GPT. Oh, for goodness sake. How do they determine who has the better I AI chat? I don't know. What's it? Why don't they get the AI chat what's it to evaluate each other and fight between themselves the chat what's it <laughs> <laughs> totally okay two things two things okay so if you're interested in trying out chat gpt and you don't know what it is and you've heard people talk about it do not go to facebook or social media and click on a try chat gpt ad no 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 okay security company in perva said that they saw some scams pretending to be access to these you know ai models artificial intelligence models and the like So just use your web browser and go to openai.com. And second tip, if you decide to use ChatGPT, know that your questions are logged by default. And some people keep sessions going tied to your account because you need to have a user login to get in to use it now. So to change this, once you've created an account, you can click on your username to the settings and clear all chats. And you can also go to the data controls and disable chat history and training. That's a really good point. That's a great point, actually, Crow. Because I mean, a company, some companies are blocking access to chat GPT because it just produces garbage sometimes and low quality content. But the more serious point is that people are feeding in sensitive information into chat gpt which is then being collated and used and maybe company sensitive and maybe other people's personal details all sorts of things exactly there was researchers at group ib said they've uncovered a concerning trend uh, involving 100,000 devices on the dark web infected with stealers holding compromised chat gpt credentials Mm. Okay, and they think that's exactly the reason that people are using it and kind of for you know feeding in uh, sensitive information without realizing it, and those logs are super you know kind of delicious to someone who might want to try and attack a company. So uh, there you go, you know, and don't use an easy to guess password if you're going to you know create a login on ChatGPT. Okay, try something that's unique and impossible to remember. <laughs> Ask ChatGPT to create a password. Yeah, for ask it. it to create the password. So I bet it'll do really well. <laughs> it'll probably search the internet to find out the list of the top passwords and it'll think, <laughs> oh, that's number one. Let me in. Use that one. I thought it was password one. It probably is. <laughs> With an exclamation mark afterwards. Yes. Oh, well, of course, because you've got to add a special character, right? So I, I did find out the answer to your question, Carol. Is to, oh. So if we, if, if, if we were to say one word a second, right? <laughs> and if we were then to say 300 billion words, how many years do you think that would take us to complete? 150. I'm guessing I have no idea. Nine and a half thousand. Well, you heard it here, folks. It has a lot of crap in it. That's a big data set. It's, it's, it's going to take more than your average USB stick to store that. <laughs> it's like a chat GPT joke. <laughs> <laughs> no. Any company can say they're trustworthy, but with this week's sponsor, Drata, you can prove it. With over 14 frameworks, including SOC2, GDPR, HIPAA, and ISO 27001, Drata gets you audit ready for crucial security standards needed to scale your business. Automated controls, over 75 integrations, and 24-hour monitoring keeps your company in compliance without manual work. And with a new open API and plenty of customization, you can build your program your way. With over 360 five-star reviews, Drata is the highest-rated 
cloud compliance platform on G2. Countless security professionals from companies like Notion, Lemonade and Bamboo HR have shared how crucial it's been to have Drata as their trusted compliance partner. So, listeners of Smashing Security, you can get 10% off Drata and waived implementation fees at smashingsecurity.com slash Drata. That's smashingsecurity.com slash D-R-A-T-A. Our sponsor Collide has some big news. If you're an Okta user, then you can get your entire fleet to 100% compliance. How? If a device isn't compliant, the user can't log into your cloud apps until they fix the problem. It's that simple. Collide patches one of the major holes in zero trust architecture, device compliance. Without Collide, IT struggles to solve basic problems like keeping everyone's OS and browser up to date. Insecure devices are logging into your company's apps, but there's nothing there to stop them. Collide is the only device trust solution that enforces compliance as part of authentication, and it's built to work seamlessly with Okta. The moment Collide's agents detect a problem, it alerts the user and gives them instructions to fix it. If they don't fix the problem within a set time, they're blocked. Collide's method means fewer support tickets, less frustration, and most importantly, 100% fleet compliance. Want to learn more? Of course you do. Visit collide.com slash smashing. That's collide.com slash smashing. And thanks to Collide for sponsoring the show. Our friends at Bitwarden have been busy this month adding some fab new features to their open source password management solution. Now, did you know that you can log into Bitwarden using a secondary device instead of your master password? Well, now you do. (laughs) Logging in with a device is a passwordless approach to authentication. It removes the need to enter your master password by sending authentication requests to other devices you're currently logged into for approval. With login for device, it can be initiated on the web vault, browser extension, desktop app, mobile app, and you can approve access on your mobile and desktop app version of Bitwarden. Very, very cool. And the Bitwarden team has hardened the security of its vaults, protecting new vaults with 600,000 iterations by default. And of course, existing accounts can also update themselves to the same level. These and many other great security features are incorporated all the time into Bitwarden, keeping your password secure from hackers. Learn more, try Bitwarden for yourself at bitwarden.com slash smashing. That's bitwarden.com slash smashing. And welcome back. And you join us at our favorite part of the show, the part of the show that we like to call Pick of the Week. Pick of the Week. Pick of the Week. Pick of the Week is the part of the show where everyone chooses something you like. It can be a funny story, a book that they've read, a TV show, a movie, a record, a podcast, a website, or an app, whatever they wish. It doesn't have to be security related necessarily. Better not be. <laughs> well, my pick of the week this week is not security related. My pick of the week this week is a documentary, which I have. I love a documentary, as you know. Again? Yes. Yeah, you're just going through a list, aren't I'm you? I'm going through Netflix's list of documentaries. Jesus. You could just variety, get a little variety next week. Can we ask for a little variety? Cheeky. Yeah, I'll pick what? For, it's been I'll, four weeks in a no, row. No, it has not. It has not. Yes, it has. It has not. It has. <gasps> it hasn't. Because last week it wasn't a documentary, was it? I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember either. Uh, but I sounded like I knew. So my pick of the week this week is a documentary called Speed Cubers, Ooh. which you can find on Netflix. And it's a documentary all about people who are incredibly good at solving the Rubik's Cube. <laughs> Didn't take long then, the movie? <laughs> it's about 40 minutes, the documentary. Right. You'd think they'd be quicker. (laughs) (laughs) It focuses on two world champions, Max Park and Felix Zemdegs, who can solve a cube in about four seconds. What? Yeah. I I did meet a guy who could do it in 10, and I know that's probably nowhere near like super (laughs) duper, but it was pretty... That's probably the top percentile though, right? That's still shockingly good. Freaking fast. I was still stuck on the first row of the first side, right? Because I was racing him. So (laughs) if you go to the World Cube Championship, you will see people not only like Max Park, who can 
complete a three by three cube. So the basic Rubik's cube, he has done it. His world record attempt is 3.13 seconds. That's his world record. Wow. Um, <sighs> one handed, he can do it in six seconds, just with one hand. So literally with one arm tied behind his back. They also have championships where people are blindfolded or people have different sized cubes as well. And somehow they can do that as well. It's absolutely astonishing. Anyway, it's a really touching story. Max Park is um, severely autistic and doing the cube has helped enormously with his life. And Felix Zendegs from Australia um, was the guy who Max Park always looked up to. And they became great buddies and then they began competing against each other. But oh. they have a genuine and lovely friendship. And you kind of think, what a lovely couple of guys. Must be nice. Mm. So I recommend Speed Cubers, Netflix documentary all about the Rubik's Cube and the masters of the cube. I really enjoyed it. Cool. Sounds pretty cool. I might even check that one out. Tom, what's your pick of the week? So mine, as as we've already ascertained, I do like a little bit of Lego. Um and I found this website called kbdcraft.store. And the KBD stands for keyboard, would you believe? Now, on kbdcraft.com, you can buy mechanical keyboards. Now, mechanical keyboards for you know those who don't know, they're the, the old style IBM clacky clacky keyboards rather than the you know laptop style keyboards that we often use now. And there is a whole subculture of building your own keyboards and customizing it. So you, the little micro switches underneath have different pressures and noises and sensitivity and all that sort of stuff. Absolutely fast. I thought you were talking musical keyboards. Oh, that was wrong. literally the first place. It was the first place I went and I was like, wow, that's so cool. And then it's a fucking keyboard. No, it's a keyboard keyboards. I on your computer. Keyboard, keyboard. keyboard. Right in front yeah, of me so, right now. And, yeah. uh, but the unique thing about yes. the KBD Craft website is not only do you get to customize your keyboard, as it were, you actually get to build the entire frame. So not only do you get the base of your, you know, which you push all the little switches into, and then put the keys on top and all that, you get to build the frame out of Lego. Or I should say, compatible to Lego. Okay, sorry, I don't know what you mean by frame. Is this what goes around the keys? Yes. Yeah, so the, if if you look at your average keyboard, you've got the keys, yes. and then you've got everything else around it, metal or plastic or whatever. You build that from Lego. Okay, so it's just the case of the keyboard which is made out of Lego. Just it's the case. Not the yeah, keys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The keys aren't made out of Lego bits and bobs. No, no. The keys are keys are standard kind. Of, well, I say standard, but they're. The the customizable you could, you know, change the, the different types of switches. I'm looking right now on the website. So so yeah, it's like a coaster, you know, for your lot for your for your keyboard somehow. That's what it looks like on the is that right? <laughs> Look a coaster? I think you're looking at something different to the Well, I'm it's like hold the like it holds a keyboard, right? You like it looks like you put slot a keyboard in. Is it a tea tray? A tea tray. Like a tea tray. That's what it looks like, a tea tray. Okay, yeah, but you build the keyboard PCB into the frame itself, so it's permanently in there. Now, the, the advantage of this is you can customize it, different colors. They offer white and gray. Uh, you can add add things to it. Uh, there are also instructions because the, their initial kit is called the Adam, A-D-A-M, and then they've got a... a numeric keypad uh, called the Kit Adams. Took me a while to work out add ADD AMS because that's what you used to add stuff with. <laughs> and you can either have them separate or there are instructions on how you can build it, you know, snap them together or even build a single tray for it. They're all currently wired at the moment, USB-C, um, but I'm sure that, you know, Bluetooth will be coming along soon at some point. You can the keyboard is backlit and you can download, you know, an open source app that allows you to customize the keys and the colors. I'm a bit dis I, I'm a bit disappointed, Tom. Really? I thought the keyboard itself would be made out of Lego. If it's just the case. Oh, come on. If it's just the case. Come on. 
And it's not even Lego, is it? So the case isn't made out of Lego. It's made out of like some generic Lego ripoff, isn't it's, it? It's Legette, really. It's just like a tiny bit of Lego. Yes, but which is compatible, as I have found. So you can modify that case any way you see fit. Oh, okay. It all works. It's all, it's all completely compatible. So, so you're not loyal to the Lego Corporation? Oh, I am. I don't buy any other kits. Oh, okay. This is the first for all right. isn't, oh, you know, okay. all right. isn't actually Lego. But, but then again, Lego aren't going to make a keyboard, and I thought this no. was quite cool. So. Okay. God, do you invite me on the show and poo-poo my ideas? So are you using this sort of uh, this this keyboard <laughs> kit to <tea tray> thing? <laughs> this, yes, I do use it. It's taken me a little bit of getting used to because I'm not used to a proper keyboard. <laughs> I'm used to the little chiclet style well, that's laptop. The thing. See, I'm exactly the same, Tom. Right, now finally we agree on something because I don't like mechanical keyboards. I like chiclet I- keyboards. Yeah, do you know what? I, th- I I agree. Actually, I think I prefer the chip yeah. keyboard. But this was good fun. What's it? Why chiclet? I didn't. I've never heard that word. Oh, the little. Mean? You know, chiclet is a uh, like a, a sweet, right? A little square sweet. Yeah. It's like a little Apple Apple MacBook keyboard. Imagine that. Yeah, a- Apple style. Yeah. There's not much travel. Yeah, yeah, on it. yeah. I must admit, you know, it's it's not my my uh, favorite go to type on thing. But it was really good fun to to build, good fun to learn about keyboard mapping and the software behind it and the science behind it. And it was a nice little construction project. Okay. 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 Yeah. That, yeah, all, a, right, I, I then, all right. I get that. That sells it. Okay. That sells right. it. Okay. Crow, what's your pick of the week? Uh, you're going to hate it and you're going to hate it. So uh, you guys can put your feet up. Sorry, but this is a podcast, an audio drama podcast. Oh, again, again. See, I got I got criticism. Listeners. Okay, I have listeners that write in going, Crawl, you give the best podcast. You get audio dramas. Yes, you're right. I do. And you can check out past recommendations. I heard both of them writing this week. <laughs> Graham, thank you for your documentaries. Okay, okay. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> So this audio drama is a 10-part supernatural thriller, okay? It's called How to Win Friends and Disappear People. And you follow a like a computer scientist, you know, a nerdy who becomes obsessed with a mysterious new neighbor. And you soon find out that the uh, geeky narrator, Nancy, right, uncovers the neighbor's dark secret She's a centuries-old vampire. See? How fun is that? And Nancy becomes her familiar and bringing the vampire into social media, you know, New York City. (laughs) And they're both pulled down this huge rabbit hole of deceit and murder and mayhem. So it's basically the whole story is vampire versus unhinged stalker neighbor. Okay? What could go wrong? That is basically the premise of the of the series. It's funny. It's twisty. It's turny. It's a bit gross. They got great sound effects. I don't know how they did them, but I'm sure a big bucket of jelly was Cabbages involved. and jelly. Yeah, exactly. It stars <laughs> Leslie Grace and Sony Bringas. Um, it's How to Win Friends and Disappear People. Find it wherever you get your podcast if you enjoy a good audio drama. Ah. Uh. A lot of our listeners do. You're right, Crow. We do get a lot of feedback. People who love your podcast recommendations. So yes, they do. If we, if we can get more listeners commending my documentary suggestions, that'd be great as well. Well, that just about wraps up the show for this week. Tom, I'm sure lots of our listeners would love to follow you online and find out what you're up to. What's the best way for folks to do that? Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, Twitter, Mastodon, I'm Tom Langford. That's uh, Tom with a T-H, because uh, Twitter would let me have the H. Uh, or at hostunknown.tv or or at the podcast, Host Unknown TV. So, yes, check it out. Terrific. And you can follow us on Twitter at Smash Insecurity. No G, Twitter and last have a G. And we also have a Mastodon a presence as well. And don't forget to ensure you never miss another episode. You can follow Smash Insecurity in your favourite podcast apps, such as Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And huge thank you to this episode's sponsors, Collide, Drata, and Bitwarden, and of course to our wonderful Patreon community. Thanks to them all that this show is free. For episode show notes, sponsorship info, guest lists, and the entire back catalogue of more than 327 episodes, check out smashingsecurity.com. Until next time, cheerio, bye-bye. Bye. Ta-ta.
Graham, I went to see Florence the Machine in the amphitheater. Oh, what? Oh, wow. Yeah, in the Roman well, amphitheater. Jill. It was fucking unbelievable. Like, it was just the most amazing setting at, oh. during, during sunset as well, which I have a few pics. And uh, uh, what was my point? I, I can't remember my fucking point now. What did you say before? Seriously, I'm having a total mind fuck. I think I think you were just showing off. If I'm don't honest, remember? No, there was a point. <laughs> I can't remember. So whatever. Who cares? Uh, anyway, Florence and the Machine at the amphitheater, and it was brilliant. Yes, and the previous act, oh, the previous act, I, I do remember. Now. The previous act was called uh, the Bad Daughter. And she was very, uh, she might be up your alley, um, Tom, I'm just saying. But she All was right. wearing, she was wearing this top that just covers her nips, <clears throat> right? So her whole bottom boob is out. Okay. Was that Tom moving the desk so he could get himself more comfortable? <laughs> <laughs> Go on, say it again, Carl. <laughs> I can't.